speak today on Bhagavad Gita 18.58. I'll talk about how to see opportunity in adversity. Machittaha sarva dhargani mat prasada tarishyasi atachetta mahankara nashoshyasi vinamshyasi. Krishna says, if you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. But if you act independently, arbitrarily, you will be lost. So I will talk, it is in four points or three points. First I will talk about four kinds of knowing or four levels of knowledge and ignorance. Then I will talk about an incident from the Ramayana which illustrates this principle of how we can learn something valuable even in difficulty. And lastly I will talk about how that can be applied in our life as a principle. So let's look at first thing. Now we all today live in a, what is broadly called as a knowledge economy. Most of us work in various fields where the kind of knowledge that we have is very important. Very few people of us work with physical labor or physical skills. Even physical labor also requires some amount of knowledge. But today education is very important because knowledge trans transforms into the capacity to contribute effectively and then earn effectively. So knowledge in one sense is like money because it helps us to earn money. Now with respect to knowledge, if we draw a quadrant, there could be four categories in this quadrant. There are things that we know and we know that we know them. There are things that we know, but we don't know that we know them. There are things that we don't know, but we think we know them. And there are things that we don't know, and we don't know that we don't know them. So, let me give you an example of these four things. Say, if somebody is an engineer, say they have an electronics engineering, then they know that, okay, I know, I'm an electronics engineer, and I know engineering. So, that's the category of we know and we know that we know. That's the basic knowledge that we know. Now, along with that, there is the second category where we know, but we don't know that we know. What does this mean? This means that every one of us, at one level, has certain knowledge that is instinctive. Like say, if parents... Uh, want their children to grow and some children they just pick up a kartal and just start playing it. So easily, so effortlessly they play it without needing any training at all. Now where do they get it? In fact, on YouTube there are videos of small babies in diapers you know, playing pianos. Now where do they learn it? It's there now, in their case, it is dramatic because we see that those kids, those small those children are having knowledge which is, makes them like a prodigy. It's in, this, in their case, that knowledge has come in the category of they know it and they know that know it. We they know it. 
But for many of us, we may know something, but we don't know that we know it. In the sense that, either we really don't know it, or we don't know how valuable it is. Okay, doesn't everyone know it? Say for example, uh, in many traditional families, there are some traditional cures. Say if you have cough, if you have a little fever, there are some traditional cures, and many of them work very effectively. Is the volume going down too much? Or are you able to hear clearly there? You're able to hear? Okay. It's good. Okay, no? So now, many of these remedies, home remedies or grandmother remedies, whatever, they might be rem remarkably effective. And the grandmother or elderly family members know it and they use it. But somebody else who doesn't know about it, they may spend a lot of money to try to cure that, take a lot of expensive medicines and still not get cured. So the value of that remedy, it's known, but its value is not known. Of course, sometimes we, there are things which, uh, there's procedural memory. You know, when a baby is first born, the, the mother picks up the baby and offers her breast milk. So the baby just knows what to do with it. Maybe experiment a little bit, but eventually the baby starts drinking. How does the baby know that? So there are things which we know, but we can't really describe how we know. So another example, this could be that, say all of us know language. But if I ask you, when did you learn the alphabet A? And how many of us remember that? We use it constantly, but we don't remember it. The things that we know, but we don't know we know them. We just know them, we may even use them. But we don't know consciously that we know them. The third is, where we don't know, but we think we know. This is often where there's the biggest problem. <laughs> where we think that we know some subject, or we, know, we have some knowledge, but actually we don't have that knowledge. So... Many times, now of course people use GPS for driving, for finding directions. Now Prabhupada writes currently in the Chaitanya Charita Amrutra purport that in India, if you want to go to a particular place and you want to ask directions, it says ask at least three people. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just ask one person. <laughs> Many times... If you, if you ask direction to people, people are unwilling to admit that they don't know. <laughs> Tell you, I go like this and you're just a short distance away. Now, short is a very relative term. <laughs> short can mean, okay, two minutes. Short can mean ten minutes. So, so, people often do not want to admit that they don't know or they think they know. Yeah, it's just straight. You go ahead and do it. It'll work. But actually, when you try to do it, it's it's not that easy to do it. In fact, every field of knowledge, at one level, if we don't go deep into it, it can appear quite simple. It's like, say, if some embroidery is to be done, or some, oh, okay, just move some needle, move something, and do the embroidery. But actually, when you start doing it, it's, it's very complicated. So, similarly, with so many things, we, we don't know them, but we think we know them. And in fact, uh, this is where often we fall in spiritual knowledge also. Many people think that I know spirituality. In fact, when I, about 20, 25 years ago, met a devotee for the first time, he came to my college hostel and gave me a Bhagavad Gita. And he offered me, sir, I know it, I already read it. I memorized verses also from it. So, now... Often the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. The greatest enemy of knowledge is the illusion of knowledge. When you think we know, the chance of learning becomes very less. So this is the third category. And the fourth category is, we don't know and we don't know we don't know. <laughs> that means, it's just that there is so much to know that what is there? At how vast something is, we don't know. Uh, at the start of the 20th century, Lord Kelvin, after whom we have the temperature scale, Kelvin, 
uh, uh, he's in charge of, he's, he's quite well known physicist. He said the biggest problem in future for physicists will be unemployment. He said all of physical reality is already been mapped. And the only thing that will be the work for future generations will be to fill in the details. There's nothing more to be known. The only problem at that time was one was black body radiation and the other was that somehow you know, the speed of light was always seen to be seen. And suppose you are moving on a very fast plane and if you are pointing light in the opposite direction. Now the speed of the light should be differing based on the speed at which the object is moving. But it is not differing like that. So the small things we don't know otherwise you know everything. But the small things led to two huge you could almost say seismic changes in physics. We had the Einsteinian uh, relativity theory coming up and then the quantum physics. And all of physics changed because of that. In fact, a prominent science journalist has written a book about physics or science in the 20th century. And he says, the story of science in the 20th century is from certainty to uncertainty. From certainty to uncertainty. In fact, quantum physics is so complicated that... There's a physicist who said that if you think you have understood quantum physics, that shows you have not understood it. <laughs> <laughs> so, quantum physics has become very complicated. And Stephen Hawking, he said in, in, the, in the first half, first decade of the 20th century that he tried to come up with one theory which could explain everything. And then finally he said, I'm happy to announce that humanity's quest for knowledge will never end. <laughs> <laughs> now, he put it in a positive sense, but essentially what you're saying is, we'll never come to knowledge. So when we consider, let's say, people are proud that we conquered space, we went to space, we have satellites, we have satellite probes, that that's true. In one sense, we may have satellites, but satellites have shown our greatness, we could go into space. But they have also shown our smallness. Because from space, we realize how big space is. So, as science is advancing, you could say knowledge is advancing, but actually understanding is not advancing so much. Because two things. The more we know, the more we realize how much more there is to know. In fact, the very word atom, in, in etymologically, atom means indivisible. That's how Dalton gave the name atom to it. But now, atomic physics is a whole universe, universe itself. In fact, that's nuclear energy, that's future where it is. So, we think we, we, we don't know that we don't know. That is also the situation we are in. And this is where, it's, why I'm talking about these four categories? That's to understand how spirituality, spiritual knowledge is important even in today's world. Through science, we are advancing in various ways and it's important <laughs> that scientific knowledge, wherever it is available and it is usable, we use it. At the same time, science, science and scientific knowledge always talks about process. It doesn't talk about purpose. How things happen is what science can tell us. But why things happen? The purpose is something which is outside the scope of science. Say for example, it's your birthday. And your mother makes a delicious cake for you. Okay, let me change this a little bit. I'll come to this a little bit. Suppose one day, suddenly, your mother makes a delicious cake. And you think, calendar, there is, there is no occasion for this. So why is she making a cake? Now, you could call all the best scientists in the world and they can study the cake exhaustively. Its chemical composition, its ingredients, everything could be studied exhaustively. But no, and you could be able to depict also, okay, how this cake was made, this much ingredient, this was heated this much, this was boiled this much. Maybe you could infer everything about the process. But no matter how much the cake is studied, by studying the cake, science will not be able to infer 
why it was made isn't it it's a different category of knowledge and for that matter even if somebody takes takes a ct scan or whatever and studies the mother's brain <laughs> even that will not tell you why she made the thing isn't it brain scans can tell a lot about the chemical the physiochemical state of the brain but they can't tell us the content of conscious experience specifically say if there is a very famous brain surgeon who is cured very complicated brain diseases he comes back home and he finds his wife is upset with him and he says come let me do a brain scan to find out why you're upset <laughs> <laughs> she will say you go and scan your brain first <laughs> so there is uh, there is a, the science can understand the physical interaction of things and the process by which things happen but the purpose why things happen that is beyond science and that knowledge of the purpose of things is what spirituality gives us arjuna at the start of the bhagavad gita had a crisis the crisis was not the process he knew how to fight very well but his his crisis was of purpose what am i meant to do so if you see most of the mental health problems that people have they are not problems of process they are usually a crisis of purpose so when somebody becomes suicidal at that time you know as devotees sometimes we send the messages you know normally we start a message with please accept my humble obeisances there's a counselor who sent it told me one devotee sent him a message please accept my final obeisances <laughs> <laughs> so now that just that could just be what you have draw uh, of demanding attention <laughs> i mean distress but the point is when somebody is suicidal at that time it is not a problem of process okay you got a failure you had a relationship break up or this or that you can still go on with life but what am i living for it is the purpose the knowledge of purpose that is extremely important and that knowledge of purpose that is something which science cannot provide us why can't it provide because science looks only at the material mechanisms and their interactions so why we are living is something which is out of the syllabus of scientific knowledge but this why is extremely important to know say when somebody has depression or somebody has suicide somebody has suicidal tendencies now nowadays a common uh, attitude is just take some some brain medication now in some cases brain medication may be helpful but the important thing is that we cannot have chemical solutions to human problems say somebody has lost someone and they are grieving then grief you cannot remove grief by taking some chemicals there has to be normal human growth by which they can recover from the grief so normally if somebody asks me you know if we are devotees should devotees take some, if they are feeling depressed should they take a medication some brain medication my answer is you have to look at your whole life if there are things which are wrong in your life say if somebody has got a very bad relationship somebody just lost their job somebody has um, as compared to some it's an addiction or something like that then if you don't work at fixing that and just take chemicals that will not fix the solution if the normal parameters of health are good in your life and still you are feeling depressed then it could be a chemical imbalance which needs to be addressed that so we all need a sense of purpose and without that sense of purpose we will not be able to persevere in life and most mental health problems come now mental health is a very complicated issue and that each individual case is different but overall what we need is a sense of purpose in life so what is the sense of we can never eliminate suffering from life it's just not possible everybody will have to suffer 
but what we can do is have a sense of purpose that makes life meaningful and suffering bearable we can't remove suffering but we can have a sense of purpose that makes life meaningful and suffering bearable is like say when a woman is pregnant now it's painful when the child is especially growing and there are labor pains but that pain is meaningful pain because from that a child is going to be born so we are not so much afraid of pain as we are afraid of pointless pain say if we are just walking along the road and a thorn pierces our foot be irritated but say it is not a thorn it is a nail that has pierced our foot and then we have to go to a doctor the doctor will give us the anti tetanus shot now in terms of sensation the nail piercing and the needle piercing are similar but in the first case we are irritated in the second case we pay the doctor <laughs> is it so in so the the problem is not just pain the problem is pointless pain if pain is purposeful we we can bear the pain or when this pain is purposeless then then we it becomes unbearable and pain becomes purposeful within the context of a purposeful life if life itself does not have any purpose then why why should we bear this pain at all so now traditionally people had the purpose provided by the family structure you now i have to i have my family members i have to take care of them i have to do this i have to do that the, the in the family structure it is the parents produce children and the children produce parents what that means is when parents have children the children also make the parents mature so when there is a family structure where there is responsibility it is responsibility that brings purpose to the extent we take some responsibility it's okay i have this child i have to take care of this child that becomes a purpose but if there is no responsibility then there is no purpose and when we talk about adversity and how to see opportunity in adversity the whole idea is today many people for them spiritual knowledge they don't even know that they don't know it i don't care for it it's on the thing or the thing i already know it but spiritual knowledge is not just about about gaining some knowing some verses spiritual knowledge is not just about reading a book the purpose of reading the bhagavad gita is not just to know the shlokas the purpose of reading the bhagavad gita is to know the purpose of life arjun had the crisis of purpose should i be fighting this war just to gain some kingdom should i be fighting against my relatives and kill them just to gain a kingdom i don't feel it's worth it but then if i'm not a warrior who's fighting against enemies then who am i so for him he didn't feel the the fight was worthwhile but not fighting made his life itself worthwhile not made made his life itself worthless so that was his crisis what to do and krishna told him don't think that you are fighting for gaining the skill you are fighting to establish dharma you are fighting to establish the rule of virtue you are fighting to do my will so krishna gave him a higher purpose and that purpose rejuvenated him but the purpose was that krishna for that krishna told arjuna fight not against the kauravas fight to establish dharma so we may have to fight against some people but we don't have to be against them it is that they are coming in the way of a particular purpose and then we fight against them you know we are nothing against people anyway 
That's why Krishna tells Arjuna fight. But then he says, Nirvairaha Sarva Bhuteshu. In 11.55 he says, have no animosity towards anyone. Don't, don't be inimical towards anyone. So don't think that the Kauravas are your enemy and you are fighting against them. No, you are fighting to establish Dharma and they are coming in the way, so you fight against them. So it was this knowledge of purpose that infused Arjun with confidence, with energy. And that's why at the end of the Bhagavad Gita he says, I have become peaceful now. My doubts are gone. I am calm now. Karishe vachinam tava. I will do your will. And he picks up the Bhagavad Gita saying, I will fight. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Partho, Dhanurdhara. He's picked up his bow. So the Bhagavad Gita's contribution is, it gives us a knowledge of purpose. And this purpose is what we all need in life. And this was uh, philosophy. As the first point I was saying about how the different levels of knowledge and how spiritual knowledge plays an important role in our life. Now let me go to the second point about how this purpose can reveal itself in different ways. When Sugriv was in the forest, at that time, it was an extremely difficult period for him. Because he, although he was a Vanara, he was a royal Vanara, he was a Vanara prince. And Kishkin, that was relatively speaking a prosperous kingdom. So he had lived in luxury, comfort, and suddenly he was exiled. And not only was he driven out of the kingdom by Wali, but Wali persecuted him. He lived constantly in fear of threat for, of his life. Fear of losing his life. And then at that time, Wali pursued, because Wali thought that uh, Sugriva has usurped me and Sugriva has conspired to have me killed. So therefore, he said, I will kill you. And Sugriva ran far and wide to try to find some place where he could hide from Bali. And everywhere where he would go, he would try to look for some hiding place, some cave, some cavern, some dungeon, whatever. Somewhere he could hide. But Wali would ferret him out. And so he would have to flee from there. And finally, after going far and wide, across the globe, finally Wali, uh, Sugri found a place which Wali could not reach. And that was in the <coughs> near the Bamba Sarovar, in the Rishayamukh mountains. There, once Wali had incurred the curse of a sage. Now, he had defeated a big demon called Dundubi and he had, after defeating the demon, he had killed him and he had flung the carcass of that demon into the sky. And while the carcass was flying through the sky, some blood from that carcass had fallen in near the hermitage of a sage who was living there. And seeing the desecration of his sacrificial arena, the sage had got angry and he said, this arrogant monkey who has desecrated my sacrificial arena, if he comes within a 10 mile radius of this hermitage, he will turn into stone. Now Ali was very powerful, but he knew these curses are much more powerful. <laughs> so <laughs> he decided not to challenge the curse. And he stayed away. And Sugriva stayed in that place. So it's interesting, sometimes we look for safety all over the world, but safety was very close for Sugri, in the, in Kishkin, near Kishkinda only. But anyway, uh, he stayed over there. After that, Wali, uh, Sugri and Ram allied and then Wali was <coughs> neutralized. And then Sugri became the king. And then after four months of the rainy season, then when Sugri was to send the various soldiers, various uh, monkeys to, the, to search for Sita. That was the agreement. That you help me gain my kingdom and you, I'll help you gain back your wife. So he starts to search and then he called monkeys from all over and they came and he started giving them directions. Now you go south, you go north, you go east, you go west. And he started describing to them that if you go to this, if you go in the north, you'll come across this mountain. And this mountain, when you come here, 
actually you can this is very difficult to cross here but you go this way there's a river and near that there's a path you can take this path and then you will come here this is how you can go so he described in detail for all the monkeys that whatever obstacles they would face how they could overcome them what obstacle they would face and how they would overcome them and he also allotted in each group of monkeys the right monkeys who would be able to deal with the obstacles they would face in that direction and then after he gave a talk explaining to all the monkeys and the monkeys were about to go and ram was there with him also and then ram turned to him he said you seem to be a geography wizard <laughs> i didn't use those words <laughs> but he said Your geography knowledge is ex- impressive. He said, "I didn't learn out of interest. I learned out of necessity." <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the necessity? To escape from yes, to escape from Bali. So, what he learned at that time, just to escape from Bali, now came to his assistance when he was serving around. Now at that time he could have just felt sorry for himself. You know, I have to run away from my own brother. I have to run away from my own kingdom. But at that time he was resourceful. He was in learning mode. Okay, let me learn this. Let me. Learn. Where is this? Where is this? Where is this? For whatever reason he learned, and when he learned that, it came to be useful for him later. So now for him. being in exile being a refuge being a fugitive practically who was always under threat it was a painful thing but within that painful situation rather than resenting it he tried to keep learning and what he learned at that time came to his help later so his purpose was to serve lord ram and in this purpose the knowledge that he had acquired in the past it just naturally came to use for him so for us when we go through difficulties you now we don't know necessarily why we are going through a specific difficulty but during through each difficulty which we are going through we can learn something and what we learn how it will be useful we may not learn at that time we may learn it later so when we have when we face any difficulty so this is the second point at all and the third point i talk about how we can have this learning attitude amidst difficulties say right now all of you are sitting and suppose there's an earthquake here <laughs> don't imagine it just think about it <laughs> if there's an earthquake now if it's a minor earthquake now if say i'm sitting here and the earthquake happens over there somewhere in the corner then i won't be shaken that much by it but the earth is quaking over there but if the earth is here i'll be shaken much more if the earthquake happens right below me i'll be tossed up so the the closer we are to the location of the quake the greater we will shake so similarly <coughs> whenever anything shakes us when something goes wrong in our life and it shakes us that is an indication that that is where something is very important for us so if that were not important that would not shake us so much but if it because it is important for us that's why it shakes us just a few days ago there was this brutal attack in christ church where in a place of worship some white supremacist went and attacked and uh, killed people who were there for worship it was brutal and it shocked especially i read that new zealand they said that more more people died in this one occasion than are killed usually in throughout the year so now to the extent this is geographically or emotionally or culturally close to us to the extent we are shaken by it now if we consider the number of people who are killed in the war in syria is thousand of time thousand times more than what is over here but because this is close to us it shakes us more now 
for us when we are seeking stability in life <clears throat> seeking strength in life uh, we all want some kind of stability which will last we may think seek it through good health we may seek it through good finances we seek it through good relationships and all these can provide provide stability or security to some extent but in all these things these are all things below which a quake can occur below which a quake can occur i just met a devotee from zimbabwe and he says the zimbabwe currency has depreciated so much it is keep going up and down but it's depreciated so much he said that we we would take a bucket full of currency to the market and when you want to buy something the shopkeeper would throw the notes away and take the bucket <laughs> and would give us something in exchange for the bucket <laughs> so we went to gas so many currency notes its value went but what happened is that currency can get terribly depreciated so we may seek security in different ways at a practical level that's important but these if is seeking this security or gaining the security is our purpose and sometimes that can be sabotaged it can just destroyed but if we understand that we are souls we are parts of krishna now krishna consciousness places us on a ground that no quake can shake <laughs> basically when you become of conscious of krishna is not just like coming to the temple and seeing krishna go becoming conscious of krishna means understanding that krishna is our ultimate shelter that krishna is our greatest object of devotion that krishna is our be all and end all when that happens then even if there is shaking around us we won't be shaken that much right so in every adversity that we have there will be specific things we all can learn but most important thing that we can learn every adversity is actually an opportunity to shift our ground to krishna consciousness whenever we are shaken by something if you are shaken by the health going down if you are shaken by the finances going down if, now those things need to be dealt with at the practical level definitely but along with that it is also a pointer indicator that i cannot have my shelter in these things i need to work to fix this but i also need to work to fix my consciousness so that my shelter is in krishna so every time when adversity hits us that adversity introduces us to ourselves so why am i feeling so disturbed by this because i'm too emotionally invested in this and this is important for me and i need to take care of it but i cannot make this my shelter my shelter has to be krishna so every adversity that we face we can see that as an opportunity to take the shelter of krishna to deepen our connection with krishna and then that will that connection with krishna will give us three things it gives calmness it gives clarity it gives confidence we yes we remember krishna we pray to krishna we become conscious of krishna we start becoming calm and then as we become calm okay this is happening this is happening what can i do once calmness comes and clarity comes and then from clarity okay i can do this i can do this i this that can from that confidence will come and then we'll be able to deal with that issue at a practical level also so i'll conclude with one incident about a last i think last last year or last last year when i had gone to america i entered america and i was i had a, i was landing at one place and from there i had to take another connecting flight to go to the place where my programs were it was a very brief connecting time and maybe very less time and i was going through immigration and i as i was clearing security suddenly 
I heard a loud alarm. Now, usually I, I use a wheelchair. So the wheelchair assistant takes me through and I walk through in between the security gate required. So I didn't notice it. I was in the wheelchair. And as the wheelchair went through, then suddenly I found that like seven, eight US security guards were pointing their guns at me. <laughs> what happened? They said that actually I use these crutches. So they said in the cr when the crutches went through the security machine, we got a high explosive alert. <laughs> and so they took the crutches and then there's one person who's in charge and he said, what is there in these crutches? I said, there's nothing in the crutches. So then he said, we'll have to break these crutches. I said, if you break the crutches, how will I walk? That is not my problem. So I was, initially I was annoyed, but then I started getting alarmed. And I started getting I was thinking, you know, first I was just annoyed that I'll miss the next flight. I thought if my crutches get broken, I'm missing a flight will be the least of my problems. <laughs> then, as I was trying to, I was trying to reason with him, maybe he had a, he was in a bad mood or whatever, and even the boss over there, he was just, I said, there's nothing in the crutches. I said, no, no, we have to break these crutches. So, in, uh, I like to recite the Bhagavad Gita verses. So, whenever I don't have much to do, I try to recite the verses. So somehow at that time, the Bhagavad Gita's 18.61 came in my mind. Ishvara sarva bhutana mridhesha yajna tishtati Brahmayan sarva bhutani yantra rudani mayaya says, Krishna says that I am guiding, guiding the wanderings of all living beings. They are all seated on a machine made of matter. So I just, I just recited this verse. My mind suddenly struck me Actually, I have probably traveled to 100, 200 flights, you know, maybe more also. And if things had to go wrong, so many places things could have gone wrong. Now, Krishna has seen me through all those situations. Krishna has guided by wandering across so many different countries. This is the thought of that. This is the thought came that Krishna will guide me now also. And then the next verse is, Tameva Sharanam Gacha Sarva Bhavain Bharata Tat Prasadat Param Shantim Sthanam Prapsasi Shashvatam Just surrender to Him. By surrendering to Him, you will gain peace. Krishna is saying. So I just prayed to Krishna and surrendered. Whatever you want, Krishna. And then, as I just offered this prayer of surrender, suddenly somebody, some other person came over there. And apparently he was the boss of this person who was quite disagreeable. He said, what is going on over here? And he said, this person we found uh, high, high, explosives, secu high, high six, 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 explosives in his crutches. I said. He looked at me and he looked at him and he said, okay, you go, I'll take care of this. Mm -hmm. then, then he approached me and he says, what is there in the crutches? He said, nothing in the crutches, I just use them to walk. And he picked up the crutches and started fidgeting around with them. And then he said, can we open this? Now the crutches, they are collapsible. Now I had never tried to open them, but I looked at it. Yeah, they're openable, I said. Okay, then we'll open it. And he started opening it. And then he opened it and then he took the bottom piece and he put some kind of prong inside it. And started pulling some, some dark kind of stuff came out of it. Then he looked at it, he dropped it. He said, put it again, it came out of dark. So said, what is this? I asked him, what does it look like? He said, it's mud. He said, yes, it's mud. So then he put it a little bit inside and took it out and more mud came out. So what had happened, before going to America, I had gone to Vrindavan to take the blessings of the dham. And there I had gone to, I had walked by the banks of the Jamuna. And because the Jamuna is highly polluted, so while walking with the, these crutches, they have this rubber padding at the bottom. So somehow the rubber padding had got spoiled and the mud from Jamuna had got inside the crutches. And because the Jamuna is polluted, so the sedimentation on the bank of the Jamuna had high metallic content. And that was detected as an explosive. <laughs> so I was thinking, actually, it was Vraja Raja, the dust of Rindavan. <laughs> that was the explosive. 
Thanks, man. I thought, yes, the Duster Vendal is the ultimate explosive. <laughs> it can actually explode all our material attachments. It can explode all illusions. But anyway, he took out a little more dirt. And then, he just put the crutches. He says, cleaning your crutches is not my job. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll do that. So then I just fixed the crutches and then I went off that. So, it was at that time, uh, just an incident which just struck me that if I had not remembered the Gita was, I don't know, probably this person might also still come. But at least I was much calmer and clearer just by thinking of that verse. <laughs> so for all of us, now when I memorize the Bhagavad Gita's verses, I never thought I would face such a situation when I would remember this verse. <laughs> but when we try to provide for ourselves resources to be conscious of Krishna, I'll repeat this point. When we try to provide for ourselves resources to be conscious of Krishna. Because being conscious of Krishna by itself, think of Krishna. What do I think of? Do I think of a form of Krishna? What do I think of? Now, each one of us has to find out how we can most easily think of Krishna. So if you consider this is a circle of bhakti activities. And this is the circle of the things we like to do. We find where these two intersect. The bhakti activities and the things we like to do. Find out where the two intersect. And where that interse the intersection is there, those activities we will be able to do very easily. If somebody likes music, somebody likes singing, then for them to maybe memorize verses and study philosophy will be difficult. But for them to sing will be very easy. They can remember Krishna better. But somebody who is more analytical, intellectual, for them, yes, Kirtan is nice, but no, I need some philosophical substance. So, so then they may have some quotes written down, some good classes, <clears throat> some intellectually stimulating content. And they have that, then that's what will enable them to connect with Krishna. So if we do this, if we see every adversity as an opportunity to deepen our Krishna consciousness, then not only will we go closer towards Krishna, but by going closer to Krishna, we will also be able to deal with the situation better. Because when you go closer to Krishna, it is not just we are running away from the problem. Rather, there is running away from the problem and there is rising above the problem. So bhakti may be done by some people in the mode of running away from problems. But the way we practice bhakti, as the Bhagavad Gita tells Arjun, Bhakti is not about running away from the problem, it is rising above the problems. Rising above the problem means that we understand that I am a soul, I am indestructible. I am part of Krishna and Krishna is Krishna's plan is infallible. And then when we have this understanding, yes, this problem has come, but I exist at a higher level. I am a spiritual being. And how can I deal with this problem? So when we provide for ourselves resources, to be conscious of Krishna, then we can rise above the problems. And by rising above the problems, we will not only go closer to Krishna, we will also get the calmness, clarity and confidence to deal with the problem better. And thus every adversity is an opportunity for us to deepen our connection with Krishna. And to see the magic of Krishna consciousness, not just in terms of solving the problems. Sometimes the problem may be solved, Sometimes it may not be solved, but we will get a better understanding of how to deal with it. Sometimes we may get release from problems. And sometimes we may get relief amidst problems. Sometimes we will just get a solution. Okay, this I can do, this will get solved. Sometimes even if it doesn't get solved, we will get relief amidst the problem. The problem is there, but it doesn't burden me so much. And that way, either way, whether we get a release from the problem or the relief amidst the problem, we will, we will experience the magic of Krishna consciousness. So adversity can be an opportunity for us to our own spirituality. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on how to see an opportunity in adversity. And for that purpose, I talked about knowledge in the four categories. What, what are the four categories? We know, what we, know. we know and we know that we know it. Then, we know, but we don't know we know it. Then, we don't know, but we think we know. And for this, 
If we don't know, then we don't know. <laughs> so, there are these four categories. Then you discuss various knowledge in different categories. And the purpose of that analysis was primarily to recognize how spiritual knowledge often is either in this category of we don't know but we think we know. Because we think spiritual knowledge is okay, just going to a temple, doing some rituals. <clears throat> or we think oh, that some people just are too rational. They think this is all just sentimental, mythological or imaginary. But we, spiritual knowledge is the knowledge that gives us purpose for life. Material knowledge, scientific knowledge gives us process. Whereas spiritual knowledge gives purpose. I give two examples or multiple examples. One is I talked about a cake. Scientific analysis can tell us how a cake was made or for what all, of what all things the cake was made. But no amount of scientific analysis can tell us why the cake was made. Similarly, somebody is upset. And we can't use a brain scan to find out why they are upset. So, many of the mental health problems facing people today are not a problem of process. It's a problem of purpose. What to do it's not so difficult to know. Okay, okay. one career move didn't work out. Let me try some other career. One relationship not working out. Let me see how I can move forward. Process is not so much an issue. It's purpose is an issue. So the Bhagavad Gita did not tell Arjun how to fight the war. There is no knowledge of archery or warfare in the Bhagavad Gita. That Arjuna already knew from his archery skills. The Bhagavad Gita gave him knowledge of purpose. We all have some small, small purposes. So one purpose for Arjuna is I'm a warrior and I have to fight. Another purpose was that, okay, I'm a, I'm a member of the Kuru dynasty, I'm going to protect my family members, how can I fight against them? But Krishna gave me a big purpose. Big purpose is not self-centered, it is God-centered. That you are fighting you to not gain the kingdom, but to establish Dharma. So, we are not so much afraid of, we don't, we don't like pain, but what we are afraid of is not just pain, but pointless pain. So, a uh, thorn or nail piercing into our foot irritates us, but a uh, tetanus, anti tetanus dose piercing our body doesn't irritate us so much. So, what we need is a purpose that is bigger than the pains of the world. We all have certain purposes. Say, I have to take care of my family, I have to, my career, I have this. We all have our purposes, but is that purpose big enough? sustain us amidst life's pains. If somebody's purpose is to have financial security and somehow they lose that itself, then what am I living for? Somebody's purpose is, oh, I want to have a good relationship. And then suddenly a relationship with the thought of good breaks down. Then what am I living for? So we need a purpose that is big enough to, to, to absorb the reversals of life. So whenever uh, the, a quake occurs, the closer the quake is to where we are, that much will get shaken. So when, we are, when adversity hits us, if we are agitated, that means that adversity has hit us at something which we are very emotionally invested in. And we do need to work at a practical level to deal with that. But another thing we need to do is, we need to situate ourselves on a ground where no quake can shake it. And that ground is Krishna Consciousness. So, understanding that we as souls are indestructible, understanding that Krishna is God, is our eternal benefactor, and then connecting with Him in devotion, that will give us an infallible stability. So, uh, for, uh, for, Sugri, for Sugri, when he was on the run, he was not resentful, but just learned of the various hiding places. And later on, for when he was Sarra, that knowledge came in useful for him. So, for us, when we face difficulties in life, why we are going through, uh, you know, what is it that is, why, what, uh, that particular, why that particular difficulty is coming, that may not be very clear for us. But if we have a learning attitude, we may learn some skills that can help us in future at a material level. But along with that, most important thing we learn is, we learn how Krishna Consciousness can provide us shelter. That Krishna Consciousness, it may give us the calm, clarity and confidence to find, to tackle the problem, to get released from problems. But even if that doesn't happen, 
it will raise our consciousness up so that we will get relief amidst the problem so we don't practice bhakti to run away from problems but to rise above the problem and we need to provide for ourselves the resources to be easily conscious of krishna so for me it was i mentioned the story of the crutches having some apparently explosive thing that for me it was remembering the verses of the gita so for each one of us we can find out what is the intersection point among bhakti activities and things we like to do and then we do that more and more and then we can have that resource accessible and thus in every difficulty that we may face we we'll have the inner resource to turn towards krishna and realize security in him and then get clarity to deal with the outer issue thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so any questions or comments <coughs> Yes. Yeah, so. Sorry, thank you again for this nice lecture. You mentioned about the uh, relationship and uh, struggle in certain relationship and leading to depression. So many a time situation arises where things are imposed on us, and it happens in family, it happens in friend, it happens even in temple as well, in workplace as well. and sometimes those things are imposed out of ego how to deal with it imposed because someone else's ego someone has ego and they don't want to accept their own fault okay and they just want to impose to yeah. show authority <coughs> how to deal with it so if somebody just imposes something which is not good on us because of their ego or their authority then what do we do at that time yeah life in some ways is like a tennis match in a tennis match sometimes we are serving and sometimes we are returning <coughs> now when we are returning at that time the player who is returning has has relatively far less control that that return player who is returning may be very good in the forehand but the serve comes in the backhand the player has to return from the backhand only which height the serve will come which velocity the serve will come which direction the serve will come there is very little control that the player has at that time so when they are returning all that they have to do is make sure that they touch the racket to the ball and get the ball back in play <coughs> eventually their time to serve will also come that time they will have much more control much more initiative so all of us will go in life through different situations so sometimes we are in the position of returning that means the control that we have is very limited so we just have to do the best we can in that situation <clears throat> and while we are doing the best that we can in that situation because somebody if now why somebody has imposed that that's a different issue right now there is a restriction for me so i have to operate within that restriction of course we can work to counter that restriction also but the fact is if that person has the authority or that person has the ego whatever the restriction is there operate within that realm keep operating within that keep getting the ball in play and eventually things will change so that constraint that limitation is not going to be forever there although sometimes at that time it can appear that it will go it will go on forever so we will all rather than looking at that this person is imposing it first we can understand this principle that there will be times in our life when our control will be limited and we it's important to learn that skill of operating <coughs> within limited controls even when our control is limited how best can i function within that limited <coughs> sometimes you feel this person is suffocating me so much that i can't do anything it's uh, it may be like that but we are never that powerless <clears throat> no matter how bad our situation is we can just do this thought exercise no matter how bad a situation is we can always make it worse you may say who wants to make it worse you think it's already bad <clears throat> no that's not the point the point is that think of the worst situation in your life that you are in can you make it worse Obviously you can. 
say if you have not done well in a particular exam and then i decide i'll not study for the other people well in that you get poor marks here you get no marks it will be worse so if every situation that we are in if we have the power to make it worse then that means we are not entirely powerless if we can make it worse we can also make it better now how much you can make it better that's variable so sometimes some some tennis players actually they they win grand slam championships primarily based on their returning skills the most players will be do well on their serve but what defines them what helps them win matches is their excellence in returning so when we are put in constrained circumstances how well we operate that is also a valuable skill and learning that can stand us in very good stead in future so if for example in this class so when i was giving the class i was serving Now, when you are asking questions, I am returning. I don't know what kind of question you are going to ask, <laughs> isn't it? Whichever question comes, I will answer to the best of my capacity. Now, some people may like the class, some people may like the question answers. So it depends on some people. Some I know some speakers they are known especially for the question answers. So that it's we there are different even within limited control, we can actually develop expertise. And I was in Singapore. so there was this uh, i was addressing a uh, they have they have a forum uh, of business people so i was, there was a, i was addressing a group of ceos over there and after that we were talking this one person he said i was an engineer and i never did very well in my engineering but then at that time when i had to do my project our project guy demanded a very difficult project to do so we had very talented people in our team and we had very talented students but they couldn't get along with each other each of them had their because they were all talented they had their own demands and he said i was not talented at all like that i could barely scrap through my engineering but somehow i was put in the project with them and i felt horrified so they are all brilliant and i can't even pass my exam and they are a topper how will i function with them but then i found that i could actually massage all their egos and make them work together <laughs> <laughs> and the whole project worked out very well and that's the time when i discovered that my talent is not in engineering but is in team building and that's how he was an engineer but he went into management and now he's become a big ceo so he was put in a situation where he said, i don't know i don't want to tell what all these people know it's a constrained situation but he tried to learn in the constrained situation so we can see an opportunity over there to learn within that to to work within a constrained situation also and apart from that we can try to find out what is the way in which we can influence that person sometimes uh, when they are in a domineering mood they may not listen but later on they might be in reasonable mood at that time they might listen to us or sometimes if there is some other person whom they respect and we talk with them and through them we try to influence they might listen and sometimes uh, some people have to learn through experience you, know, you do it your way and then you see it doesn't work then that's why they will learn so if somebody has that ego we have to find out how to work with that so either we try to help them understand or we get others to help them understand or then life will have to teach them okay Any other questions? Yes, I have please. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I'll answer that. Yes. That's from the first mm. uh, lecture you gave. So I was a bit confused. Like you said that day, that we have to take um, different people or organizations as part or equally. So how is it that possible that it yeah. comes to execution or functioning at the ground level? Yes. Mm. Understand. Yes. So earlier in an earlier class, I mentioned that we shouldn't reduce people to their group identity. See everyone as individuals. But don't we need to see group identity also? Say if somebody is following a particular organization. we will we are following a particular spiritual path others are following a different path so there has to be some amount of differentiation how can we just not look at the group identity at all 
No, my point was not to not that we shouldn't look at group identity at all. My point was we shouldn't reduce people to group identity. That group identity is definitely a marker of of a person's uh, a person's overall identity. So say if somebody says I won't look at group identity at all. If I start talking with a six-month-old baby, like is this, like they are twenty-five-year-old adult, I can't. So, so group identity. Okay, this is a baby. If I am talking with a particular person from a particular country, I let us speak in a language that is appropriate for them. So group identity is definitely a characteristic we have to keep in mind. And when we are following a particular path, naturally, every bond brings a boundary with it. Every bond brings a boundary with it. Say, before people are married, then they might just freely mix with many other people. But if they get married, that bond comes. But that bond brings that boundary with it. So similarly, when we follow a spiritual path, it's a bond. We're trying to be bond with Krishna, and we're trying to bond with Krishna by following a particular process. So when the bond comes, along with the bond, boundary will also come, and the boundary needs to be respected. It needs to be understood. It needs to be respected. So, if somebody is worshiping Krishna or is worshiping God in some other path, then we respect them for their path. But at the same time, we have to understand that this, there are some differences, and the recognizing those differences is important for being able to properly follow our path. And just like, say, if a student is studying uh, in Oxford, and <coughs> The, there is another university in England which is very famous. Which is the other one? Cambridge. 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 Yeah. So now, now in Cambridge, some other something is being taught in some other way. Now, if the student is, wants to get a degree from Oxford, that student has to commit to studying according to the Oxford pattern of study, and that's how the student gets promoted to get a degree. So if there's a different way of teaching in Cambridge, we respect that, but we can't mix the two. If you want a degree from Oxford, you have to follow Oxford. On a degree from, if you want to follow that process, then go to Cambridge. So that bond with Oxford will bring a boundary of Oxford. Similarly, when we follow a particular path, there will be a boundary that will come with it, and the boundary has to be respected. At the same time, say I was I was had gone to Oxford, so there was one. They have that guide who was taking us around, and she said she said you know sometimes terrible things happen in Oxford also. People from Cambridge come here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she was joking, but she spoke it very seriously. <laughs> so they have that rivalry going on over there <laughs> from a long time. So now, uh, so if people in Oxford have a stereotype of how people in Cambridge are, now maybe they are high, they are um, arrogant, or whatever. Now it could be that some people over there are like that, but it's not that everyone there is like that. So we don't have to reduce every person to that identity. So if somebody is doing things in a particular way, then we have to observe them. And if that person is arrogant, okay, they are arrogant. That's all how they are. But we don't have to presume, uh, not even presume. I would say presumption is possible, but reduction. That means we don't let the person. Present themselves as an individual at all. Oh, you are from there. That means you must be like this, and we reject them. That's that's what we should not do. But certain amount of categorization and distinction is essential for functioning in life. Without that, we can't function at all on a practical basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, first of all, I just like to say it's wonderful, wonderful to have you back with us so soon, and uh, we, we all, I'm sure, I can speak on behalf of all of us in saying we hope that continues. Um, it's always a pleasure to to uh, hear how you can analyze things and break them down and make them uh, you know take complex. Subject matter to make it easily understandable for us all. So thank you. There was just one point um, I wanted to maybe get cl clear up a little bit, and I made a couple of notes. Um, 
So just on that, that point about finding that, you know, that type of bhakti or that limb of bhakti uh, amongst, you know, the 64 angas, which we can connect with. Um, and, it's, and it's such a good point. Um, and I just want to clarify a comment, um, if I may, uh, around that that, that you, you spoke on. Um, just in regard to Nam Sankatan, um, and it was nice you brought that up. You know, um, you gave the example that if people like to sing, and if they're musically inclined, perhaps Nam Sankatan is the limb of bhakti they should, you know, naturally gravitate towards. But if they're more intellectually inclined, then Kirtan is nice, but I need some philosophy. So, and I just, that inspired me, I just, I remembered a few really nice verses, or quotes, which just bring those words, words together, because I think it's really important that we understand that this is not um, a musical thing, practically at all. Um, in fact, and, and I've, I've made, I think there's a couple of verses here which might just clarify what it's all about. Um, but one, one amazing quote from Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he says that in Kali Yuga, intelligent people prefer to take exclusive shelter of Yuga Dham, Parinam, Sangatam as a means to achieve all spiritual perfection. That's the first one. Then in Chaitanya Bhagavad, um, it says the culmination of all knowledge that is to be obtained from all the, the scriptures. The culmination of all knowledge from all scriptures is the congregation of chanting the most holy names. And then, one more, you know, familiar to us to us all is the Krishna Varna, the Shakri Krishna from the Bhagavatam. I won't recite it because I'll probably screw it up. <laughs> but it but it says um, the English is basically that in in Kali Yuga, people who have uh, Sumedha Saha, they have uh, sharp intelligence who worship the incarnation of Krishna with a golden complexion. Although he's not, although he's not blackish, he's that self-same Krishna manifest in the Kali Yuga. And people who have intelligence in Kali Yuga will show that they have intelligence by, by worshipping Lord Chaitanya through the performance of Congregation of Chant. This is not about music at all. Um, so I got your point. Yeah, so I, I, just, I could. Yeah, I think that's I, a valid point. I'll just yeah. make a response to that. Thank you. Now, the chanting is not just musical, it is transcendental. It is the culmination of all knowledge, it is the culmination of all philosophy. That's definitely true. Having said that, in the when we are right now in the conditioned stage, moving towards the transcendental stage, at this stage, each of us has to find out the access way to Krishna that works the best for us. So, both ways I would say that. Somebody who is very intellectual, they will be studying philosophy. Now, they might just like anything intellectual. They can, they can read some materialistic subjects also, which are intellectual, they may like it. If they write something about Krishna, they will also like it. But gradually, if they are reading something about Krishna, the Krishna connection will be established. And then it becomes like from the intellectual to the transcendental becomes the pathway for them. So similarly, when somebody is relishing Kirtan, are they relishing it at the transcendental level or are they relishing it at the musical level? Most people when they come initially, they will relish it at a musical level. Or oh, just nice music. But that's one of the strong points is to to kind of attract the mind to That's the true, but it's a tool. No, that's, that, that, let me complete my point. Mm. The point is that somebody who is relishing it at a musical level, they like music and they like this music also. But they're, they are experiencing transcendence, but they are not yet at a transcendental level. They are themselves not at a transcendental level. That's why we have in India so many, one of the most famous bhajan singers, very popular. No, he was also like an alcoholic. Alcoholic, literally. So, in fact, uh, the narrator told that most of the bhajans that are like very 
very popular devotees people recite it and hear it he would all he would sing them after going high on alcohol so well it is at least he was singing about god that's good but was he really experiencing something transcendental in a way that was transcendental not necessary so oh, when, <coughs> when, just to let, let, let me complete what I'm let, me, let me let me complete yeah. what i'm saying right yeah. now so my point is that different people naturally find different things attractive and those things will be the easiest for them to do sure. so bhakti is transcendental even philosophy is not intellectual and krishna says when you are studying the bhagavad gita he saying adeshyate chayiman dharmam samvadam avyo gyana yagyena tenaham ishtasyam iti he said you are worshiping me with your intelligence just like you may do aarti with diya krishna is saying when you are studying the bhagavad gita you are doing the aarti of me with your intelligence yes. <coughs> so even the philosophy is not intellectual sure the kirtan is not just music the philosophy is transcendental the kirtan is transcendent what we are talking about here is what is the access way that works best for different people yes so for somebody who likes music the musical connection with krishna will be easier to establish for somebody who is analytical and intellectual the intellectual connection with krishna will be easier to establish for somebody who is who is who has the some other interests that particular somebody who likes to do drama for them thinking about oh this drama this role this dialogue this setup this costume that's what they engage them sure so each one of us has to find out how best we how not best how most easily most accessibly we can become conscious of krishna and that may not be the highest form of krishna consciousness but that is the most easily accessible form of krishna consciousness for us to get our consciousness out of matter and towards krishna once we get our consciousness towards krishna then gradually we can become purified so we can't become pure devotees without becoming devotees first we have to have a connection with krishna and then we can have a pure connection with krishna so we are talking here about how best the connection can be established for people at their particular level so whatever is anyone's deepest experience that is their experience of krishna <coughs> somebody is a writer and they spend hours writing now editing one word editing one paragraph and they spend hours and hours now what are they experiencing over there actually they are experiencing an opulence of krishna over there just they don't know that they are experiencing krishna but if you can connect them your writing what is the taste in they are getting and writing constructing a sentence well and having rhyme having elegance having precision they are actually experiencing the aspect of krishna everything that is attractive krishna says manifests a spark of my spirit so whatever is anyone's deepest experience that is their experience of krishna just that they don't know that they are experiencing krishna but if you can give them that experience or we can give them that facility of your you like writing okay you write for krishna and i know devotees who they come to temple and and the one devotee he came for us with us to vrindavan and he went to vrindavan went to all the holy places and it's nice and he came back and he wrote a travel log about his experiences in vrindavan and he told me that in writing that travel log i actually experienced vrindavan more than when i was in vrindavan because in writing i was more absorbed okay this was not a experience I did more research. I wrote about it. So each person is an individual, and based on the kind of body mind that we have, we will experience Krishna differently. So we need to provide everyone the facility and the freedom to experience Krishna in a way that they naturally experience things deeply. So if for somebody it is music, that's wonderful. For somebody it is analysis, that's wonderful. For somebody it's drama, it's wonderful. for somebody is cooking that's also wonderful so we have to ultimately become a job in krishna and yuga dharma in this particular age is chanting of the holy names 
and that's why it's especially important. Definitely, it's not musical. It's ultimately transcendental. Okay. Okay. Maybe we can talk more about this later. Also. Okay, thank thank you. you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, appreciate your, your reply, and um, I think it was just I didn't. You know, we have to be clear that it's not just one of the limbs of bhakti. Rather, yeah, all the other limbs of bhakti depend on also doing the yuga dharma, but they're from them to fructify. You know, so. I may be worshipping Krishna by my intelligence reading Bhagavad Gita. I may be worshipping mm -hmm. the Diddy, but you know, Harinam Abhikavam, you know, that Harinama, Harinama, Harinam Abhikavam. In Kali Yuga, we have to make sure we have that understanding. That's right. Thank you. you know, but thank you. Thank you. You had a comment or question? Okay. Thank you very much. The Prabhupada the key. Go to Bhakta Vindaki. Go to Bhakta Vindaki. Go to Bhakta Vindaki. Thank you.